All right. Um, actually, uh, I, I was going to introduce Una, but uh, but Steve is going to do the honors. So, so that's, yeah. Great. Uh, so um, thank you, because it's a pleasure to introduce Una. Um, first place, I, uh, you know, I mean, of course, I know Una very well, but I, as one always does, I first looked up on the web to see whether there was something I didn't know. And I searched for Una Kim, and it offered me Una Kim Stanford basketball coach. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, that wasn't right. At any rate, uh, Una is a uh, renowned condensed matter theorist. Uh, she's made contributions broadly to the field of quantum materials. She's been interested for many years in high temperature superconductivity, in topological order, in quantum Hall effects, in the strange metals. And more recently, she's been a pioneer in the use of neural network-based machine learning to recognize both uh, theoretical and experimental patterns in these complex systems. Uh, she's currently a professor of physics at Cornell University. She was got her PhD at uh, UIUC in Champaign-Urbana uh, with my friend Eduardo Fratkin. And then she came to Stanford as a postdoc and she's one of uh, our uh, postdocs about whom we like to boast. Her accomplishments are of course entirely hers, but we claim credit for them. Uh, without any further ado, then, uh, uh, Una. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. And I'm really happy to be uh, speaking at this colloquium. But I must say, seeing all the friends, you know, I, I really feel bad that I cannot be there physically. I so wish I was there. Uh, you know, I, I wish I was at Stanford, you know, really visiting. Um, so I want to talk about harnessing data revolution in quantum matter. And um, I, I'm going to give some sort of general overview, but um, some details you'll find in this paper. Uh, oh, I didn't get to, let's see. Uh, yeah, in this paper, and uh, these are preprints where you'll find more details. So, um, the, the community has been for a long time wanting to understand how different structures lead, lead to very different properties and how certain kinds of material would become high TC superconductor. We've been wanting to understand and control these um, quantum materials, quantum matter. And um, as a, out of a desire to understand more, so that we can control better, so that we can predict better, people, uh, the community have been putting in a lot of effort and energy to try to extract more information. So information content in a perfect, perfectly ordered simple uh, material is intensive. Perfectly ordered meaning if you have a perfect crystal, all you need to know is the unit cell. And uh, for the material that's shown here, cadmium renate, unit cell is pretty big. But still, you know, for such uh, a crystalline system, the information content reduces to about 100 bits. Now you introduce defects, you introduce distortions, you introduce possible doping, fluctuations in charge, orbital, and spin. At that point, um, information content stops being intensive, and it can actually become pretty big. Now, um, in one way of estimating information content in uh, material with defects and so on, could quickly exceed the total information content in the Library of Congress, which is uh, estimated to be about 200 terabyte, 20 terabytes. So um, the effort in the community have been to try to extract as much information as possible. Let's try to observe as much as possible. And such efforts led to data revolution. Now, for instance, um, now we have operational quantum systems, although noisy, you know, you can have up to 60 qubits, 
Now, the space of possibilities that you're talking about is exponentially big compared, you know, as a function of number of qubits. And you want to go from the measurements to the state or the density matrix. You, if you if you do computations, you want to be able you want to know what is the state that you've got and what is the state that you've done computations on. Tunneling density of states in 1962, uh, the measurement setup was simple. There is a um, sort of macroscopic tunnel junction, and the outcome, the data, is a single curve. This is a famous curve close to the hearts of many. Uh, who has devoted uh, much effort uh, into the, the superconductivity. This curve is loved and understood in every detail. You, you understand why there is a suppression of the tunneling conductance, which is measuring the density of state. We understand why there is a peak, but not only those salient features, we understand why there are these wiggles. Those being able to account for these wiggles gave us confidence that we understand what's going on. Now, fast forward to 2000s, instead of having a macroscopic tunnel junction across the system, we formed this kind of atomic scale um, tunnel junctions. And instead of a single curve, we have data set that's like three dimensional because there are curves at every single point um, at, of the, uh, being scanned. And you can open a textbook such as Ashcroft and Merman, uh, coming from Cornell, um, and you don't find any guidance on how to think about this kind of data. Now, how about X-ray diffraction? Um, in 1913, Bragg and Bragg, father and son, wrote this paper, which was kind of foundational um, result that led to them winning the Nobel Prize. This was the uh, paper where they explained for the first time how to think about these kind of peaks that you see as you rotate the sample and you may, may measure the um, X-ray intensities. Now, there are only three peaks in here, and um, the, but this was the very first successful forward modeling. What is forward modeling? When you don't know what you started with from the, the data that you have, you try to forward model, given your assumption, what kind of data that you would arrive at and try to compare the data that you have uh, that started from your conjecture with the data that you have. Now, the forward modeling described in this paper is of course the famous result that we now learn and we now teach in introductory physics. That is um, by assuming that there are um, atoms that's forming a lattice, they, uh, they guessed that, okay, if I have a lattice like this, I would have an interference condition we now learn as a Bragg condition. And based on the location of these peaks, I can figure out the distance between the planes of the atoms. Now, um, that was more than 100 years ago, but still today, the way we think about X-ray data has not changed tremendously in the sense that we still rely on forward modeling. However, the data content have changed a lot. So this is, an, uh, this is a slide from my collaborator, Ray Osborne at uh, Argonne National Lab. He's describing how uh, the, the control that you have and the detectors that you have and the resolution you have allows you to now map out uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, brilliant zones, and the data that you're acquiring now is uh, terabytes. So now, um, how do we approach, uh, how, do we, how do we face, how do we deal with this kind of uh, revolution in data? This is um, quickly approaching with what I call um, drowning in the goodness. We have all this amazing good data, but you know we don't know exactly what to do with it. So the effort that uh, my group have been pushing for the last couple of years is to bridge the experimental data in its complexity, richness, and novelty with um, some theoretical understanding, making use of data science tools such as probabilistic modeling or deep neural network 
so that we can go from experimental data to theoretical understanding in uh, objective way. And by having objective and also efficient and fast um, insight that we can impact how we do experiment, hopefully sometimes real time. So um, over the course of the last couple of years, we have tried um, this, we, we've tried to push this new direction of trying to harness data revolution in various different types of data. We've worked on um, we, we've worked on trying to do quantum state tomography on natural language processing based um, ap approaches on the data acquired from IBM Q. We've looked at uh, STM data in this paper. Uh, we looked at resonant ultrasound spectroscopy data in uh, uranium ruthenium to silicon two, trying to gain some insight into hidden order. We've also looked at uh, simulated data uh, and trying to gain an understanding of non-fermi liquids. Now, the uh, specific um, adventures that I want to talk about today have to do with uh, X-ray diffraction data. Um, the tool that we've developed, we've dubbed XTEC, which I'm going to get into later, and uh, quantum gas microscopy data. Now, um, this view of looking at all these type, different types of data and different types of problems might look uh, a little um, disorienting. It could be too much of diversity. So um, let me try to give you, like, if you are to remember one thing, um, the key insight that is kind of um, guiding how we are, my group is approaching uh, the data revolution is the following. It's, it's kind of introspection. We all like to try to look at some complex real data and try to arrive at simple principles. Physicists love having simple um, organizing principles. And we feel like we've understood something when we can make prediction. So these are two ways that we want to be able to go back and forth. And the insight is, it's not only physicists who like to do this. Um, generally, even with the sort of real world data, the data scientist's uh, job is to go from real data to simple principles, and that's called regression. And you want to be able to generate a model or model what's going on in the real world through uh, generated modeling. So there are tools that people have developed, the communities have developed, and perhaps we can harness those tools to make progress on our problems. Now, the challenge, though, is that physics, unlike many other disciplines, is a field that has long history, and we have very rigorous framework and, and um, perspective on how we think about things. And for us to believe on something as actually giving us progress, we need to be able to put uh, anything that we learn back into the principles of physics. So from the data science or machine learning perspective, that comes down to interpretability. We need to be able to interpret what we've learned using these tools for us to be able to um, actually make uh, progress and contribute to the development in science. So um, that interpretability is important, and for the interpretability to be present, um, something that we came to appreciate over time is the following principle. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a uh, industrial grade blender. It's a wonderful tool if what you want to do is to make smoothie. But um, if your goal is not to make smoothie, but to make guacamole, then it's not the blender that you want to use, but you might want to use what looks like uh, sort of a Stone Age tool, which can be nevertheless quite expensive, um, because this tool will allow you to see what ingredients are going in, and it allows you to control how much you're going to mush it, right? And the same principle that I that we come to really appreciate is that when we use these data science tools, we want to use minimalistic approaches that can integrate key physics principles so that when we have results, we can interpret it back with, from the perspective of physics. So um, now the one of the two, the uh, 
the first of the two uh, specific problems that I want to talk about um, is has to do with X-ray data. Um, this is unsupervised machine learning for um, high volume XRD data. And we've developed a tool which we called um, XTEC, short for XRD temperature clustering. This work was done in collaboration with colleagues in computer science at Cornell and um, X-ray uh, experimentalists at CHESS and Argonne National Lab. And <clears throat> my students, Jordan Bendeley and Michael Meddy have done really the lion's share of the work. So what are we after um, out of X-ray data? So um, as a, a quantum condensed matter um, theorist, my main interest is in trying to understand emergent phenomena, such so, uh, symmetry breaking, spontaneous symmetry breaking, or some um, novel fluctuation phenomena. So type of, type of symmetry breaking that we can detect from X-ray are um, charge density waves, and there's also a notion of intra-unit cell order. So here's an example of what uh, X-ray intensity will look like if you have a one-dimensional system with two um, sites per unit cell. If uh, in an undistorted state, my X-ray intensity looked like this. This is in reciprocal space. Um, I have uh, I have Bragg peak, which are um, affected by the form factor, and uh, I have peak at every integer position. Now, if I develop charge density wave, which um, changes the size of the unit cell, in this case, the unit cell size has been doubled. With the doubling of the unit cell, um, in, with the charge density wave of period 2A, uh, what, what the new phenomena that emerges is uh, these peaks at half integer positions. These are super lattice peaks. But um, this simulation shows you that not only that you just get peaks as um, the new positions, there is a form factor associated with them and different uh, Brillouin zones. These are different Brillouin zones. Uh, different Brillouin zones are going to give you different um, intensities. What I call intra-unit cell order is uh, symmetry breaking that does not change the size of the unit cell. So in this case, the unit cell has now ha was doubled with the charge density wave. Uh, with this particular intra-unit cell uh, symmetry breaking, the unit cell size have not changed. However, there is obviously symmetry breaking going on. <clears throat> this symmetry breaking uh, would, uh, would manifest itself in uh, X-ray data through um, only through the uh, form factors of Bragg peaks. Meaning we have peaks at the same integer positions. We do not have any new peaks, but you can observe that the heights of these peaks are changing subtly compared to undistorted case. And you can imagine that um, this intra-unit cell order without a new peak showing up could be much more tricky to detect. So um, we were interested in um, trying to develop new tools that can help us deal, discover interesting ordering phenomena when we have uh, 100,000 Brillouin zones to deal with. Now, um, trying to sort through 100,000 um, peaks as opposed to three peaks that Bragg and Bragg had is an overwhelming task. Um, now, facing this overwhelming task, we thought about, well, I thought about another um, overwhelming task, at least personally for me, which is um, searching for that special piece in a Lego set. Pandemic parenting um, have given me ample opportunities to develop, further develop my love-hate relationship with Lego sets. And um, of course, this is a problem of much smaller scale, but it's, uh, it shares um, some key aspects with the problem of X-ray data. Now, if you're asked, as I was so often asked, to find a special piece in a big pile of Lego, you quickly find that a strategy of picking up one piece at a time, inspecting and deciding whether it is the piece that you're looking for or not is a very ineffective strategy. We get tired, it's a monotonous task, and we cannot hold attention until we exhaust all the Lego sets. So uh, quickly you find that yourself um, sorting instead of trying to find inspect one piece at a time. 
here is an example of having sorted the Lego pieces in, in, uh, according to their color. But depending on what is uh, what your goal is, you might choose to sort by shape. Shape or color is what seemed to be an obvious choice for me uh, in trying to sort through Lego sets. Now the problem is with my um, X-ray data, what would be what would play the role of shape or color? What kind of sorting criteria can I use if I want to go in without uh, any prejudice but discover something that's interesting? Um, what we turned to was the idea that, hey, we are interested in um, some effect of underlying Hamiltonian. So we are interested in emergent phenomena, some uh, spontaneous phenomena that's occurring driven by the energy or Hamiltonian. So my starting point is that I have X-ray intensities at different um, reciprocal, reciprocal space positions as a function of temperature that is um, free amplitude of density. And um, if I want to develop a tool that can have um, a broad applicability, I do not want to design this based on some specific of a particular um, system, but I want to rely on some fundamental principle. And the fundamental principle that we thought, thought about was that um, no matter what the Hamiltonian is that determines the energy, there is always a competition between Hamiltonian and or energy and the entropy, and what's controlling the balance is temperature. So um, the, as you lower the temperature, the desires that are driven by the Hamiltonian underlying interactions will be shown up as um, showing one type of temperature dependence. And uh, what, what is a randomness, random noise, would have a different type of temperature dependence. So we had the idea that let's tr we can anticipate different qualitatively different types of temperature dependence, different types of temperature series among the population of um, reciprocal space points. So here's an example of um, how that kind of evolution looks like. This, this is titanium diselenide data that we burned to develop the tool. It's a material that is well known to um, develop charge density wave. And you can see here, as you, if you have chosen the right plane, this is the half plane where the charge density wave peaks exist. These um, super lattice peak becomes fainter and it sort of disappears as you go up in the temperature. Whereas um, this kind of background is more or less temperature independent. So that was the idea, that was a simple idea. Now, uh, when you try to amplify, implement that idea and see where you can go with it. Um, the first thought was to try to, okay, let's plot all the temperature dependence of intensities. And this is what you get. It's a, it's a huge mess because the scale, the dynamic range for the intensities is ginormous. It's, you know, many orders of magnitude. And the noise um, do not necessarily have low intensity, just it can be high intensity, there are instrumental noise. Um, so we had to figure out how to sort through this mess first and try to make it something that we can manage. So we developed a pre-processing scheme. It's really my student Jordan came up with the idea of how to pre-process. And um, with a principled approach, he was able to figure out how to process this data and um, reduce it down to the data set that has a meaningful temperature dependence. Now, when we uh, threshold and rescale and uh, 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 thresholding means to means to um, separate out the data from the noise and uh, which means our volume of the reciprocal space to be investigated have also shrunk. So now we're not going to investigate this um, vast empty space because X-ray data is rather sparse. We're just going to focus our attention to the um, selected set. Now, even then, um, without um, pre, uh, presupposed knowledge, trying to discover a uh, qualitative trend is not easy. And what we turned to was an approach that was very effective in the speaker verification. Now, if you have um, 
Alexa, Siri, or one of these uh, AI agents around, you will know. You will know that um, they can. Uh, some of them can recognize different voices. Uh, our device have learned to separate my voice from uh, my family members' voices. And the speaker verification works when multiple people are speaking. So this is a voice train of multiple people. If a speaker verification works well, it can sort it into two different uh, voice trains. So, and, and this is done without having a model for what each, each voice train should look like, but it's um, done by learning what a, a characteristic of a given voice train. So using this sort of approach, we, um, we have developed what's called Gaussian mixture model. Really from a um, probabilistic modeling perspective, this is kind of like that guacamole uh, mortar and pestle. So it's a very simple approach. So uh, because it is really simple, I thought I would um, try to sort of give you a flavor of how it works. So the Gaussian mixture, to apply our Gaussian mixture model, which um, we called XTEC, the first step is to um, pre-process the temperature series for each reciprocal space position I, Q of I. So I have a, a vector because I measured this at different temperature points. So my vector is associated with a particular uh, reciprocal space position. I have different temperature measurements and I could have measured it for some dt dimension. So for uh, some, some data set, we looked at sometimes we have 30 temperature measurements, sometimes we have uh, 20, sometimes we have 40. And then the next step is to conjecture uh, multiple k distinct multivariate norm normal distribution. Now we all know what normal distribution is. Normal distribution is um, specified with uh, mean and variance. So let's say I have mean, which is uh, also the T dimensional and variance. And I'm going to assume multiple such distributions with K running from one to capital K. Now the conditional probability that the data set that I actually have, my real data, uh, that temperature series belong to a particular normal distribution is going to be proportional to uh, Gaussian. Minus one half, my data minus the mean and uh, inverse variance, my data minus mean. Okay, so now I have this normal distribution that I have assumed, and then I have a uh, probability for my uh, entire data set to be explained by a mixture of these Gaussians. So my pi is a mixing rate. Now I'm going to assume multiple uh, means and multiple variances. And uh, this total probability is given as a product of each of the uh, Q points that I'm looking at where I'm doing a weight sum over different normals. Okay, so this my Q, this um, intensity was um, labeled a particular position QI, and I'm sub, um, product, making a product over all points. So we are treating um, at a, at this simplest level individual Q points as if it's an individual population. And then um, the task, machine learning task, is to figure out what is the right, uh, what is the optimal weight and means and vari variances that uh, best describe the data. So this, we are just trying to learn what is the best way to describe the data. And once we learn um, these uh, hyperparameters, so-called, through expectation maximization algorithm, we have cluster assignment for each uh, reciprocal space point given by the weight associated with that point Q of I, the possibility, the likelihood of that Q of I belonging to a cluster K given by the weight uh, for that cluster K 
and the learned normal distribution um, and normalized. So it's, it's really simple. Now um, we run this approach on, uh, we, uh, we've applied this to uh, several of the um, X-ray data sets and a uh, particular data uh, analysis that I want to share with you today is um, that, that done on paracloricadmium renate. Now cadmium renate is the first known paracloric superconductor uh, which grabbed the attention of the community as a superconductor, superconducting paracolor material. But recently, uh, this it was noticed that uh, the existing understanding about this uh, phase, structural phase transitions may not be complete. And in this paper of, uh, from Caltech, they have used the uh, optical technique of nonlinear optical technique of second harmonic generation to uh, conjecture that uh, perhaps what's going on in the system is electronic pneumatic transition and uh, the existing wisdom in the system, in the community about the nature of this transition uh, may not be complete. So my collaborators and I set out to explore uh, a comprehensive data set on this material so that nothing would be missed. And the key question about this transition here was whether the uh, nature of the primary order parameter was two-dimensional EU representation or one-dimensional T2 representation. The latter was uh, what was proposed by this Caltech group's paper. So setting out to try to see whether there was anything missed and to leave nothing um, unturned, we've uh, analyzed 15,000 Brillouin zones, eight terabytes of data. XTEC algorithm analyzes uh, that volume of data in 15 minutes. Now, um, and and the result is very simple. Now, you, you know if if someone showed me this plot and said this is a result of analyzing eight terabytes of data, I would have had a difficult time believing it. But um, it looks very simple, and um, there is clearly something that's familiar looking here. So this behavior here is very familiar looking, sort of order parameter looking behavior. Now this, for, for uh, x tag, what we said are the number of clusters. That's the only thing we said. So we tried with two clusters here, and we found one of them to have clear onset that looks like an order parameter. I emphasize the importance of interpretation for this approach. Um, interpretation can be is really simple, because all you have to do is you look at where these cluster assignment came from. This is kind of like uh, looking at the population and asking, uh, sorting the population based on their uh, their tendencies. And you, now you can look at where they came from to gain insight on uh, whether uh, this is a meaningful result. So uh, to interpret, we look at where these intensities came from and the colors are matched between two sides. And what you notice is, um, that these purple that had sort of order parameter like onset behavior came from the reciprocal space point. These are all Bragg peaks. This material, uh, the, the structural transition is not, uh, does not change the size of the unit cell. There are no new peaks showing up. But what you do see here is that uh, all the purples are coming from the uh, one of the indices of HKL being uh, not, not, uh, not multiple of four. And um, what this says is that these peaks that were suppressed at a high temperature phase now became allowed uh, at lower, with the lower symmetry uh, at temperature below 200 Kelvin. And just based on this selection rule, we can um, already rule out all other possibilities other than uh, these two structural um, possibilities, structural uh, structure possibilities. The first one is the one that will lead um, amount to two-dimensional order parameter. And second one, 
would have um, given us a first order transition. So the fact that this order parameter behavior looks very second order like is already a uh, indica strong indication that out of these two, the first one is more likely. Now, in order to gain further understanding, now this is uh, compared to the uh, reciprocal space that I have shown you at the beginning, this looks very simple. And the reason why this is, looks simple is because we've lumped all the reciprocal space near points near the Bragg peaks to be behaving together. So then what we did was to open them up and let um, all reciprocal space points have individual choice in which uh, kind of behavior they find themselves in. Um, and um, we allowed for there to be more number of uh, clusters. The number of clusters are determined empirically at the moment. We try change the number of clusters and we watch whether the results change. And for this data set, when we uh, took this approach, we found um, beyond four, all results were essentially um, identical to having four clusters. So we settled on four clusters and we found um, these four different behaviors. Now we can look at where these clusters came from uh, because we have we're trying to give you some sense of um, the, the large number of blue zones and that everything becomes very small. So let me blow this up. When you blow up, these are each um, lattice Bragg peak positions. But what, what we found that was really um, unusual and surprising was that these cluster assignments were not between different Bragg peaks but actually the centers of all the Bragg peaks were uh, clustered into one cluster. And that one cluster has mild temperature dependence. This is temperature, the TC is up here at 200 Kelvin. And we are intentionally looking at temperatures well below TC to avoid confusion due to critical fluctuation. So away from the critical fluctuation centers of all these peaks, behaves more or less um, uh, equivalently, and they, they all behave the same way, and they have very, very mild temperature dependence. However, the diffuse regions surrounding the Bragg peaks were um, separated into two different type of clusters. And the two clusters, one of them, the red cluster is right here. This is the red cluster which shows um, heightened intensity all throughout the phase two. This is all throughout phase two. And this blue cluster had very uh, relatively weak intensity in phase two, and it turns on at the lower temperature phase. When I first reported this result um, to my colleagues at Argonne National Lab, they had, they had difficulty believing in this, like they, it was very unintuitive. It was very unusual. Um, people are, were not used to thinking about diffuse region around Bragg Peak having different temperature dependence compared to the center of the peak. What, what is this? Uh, uh, where is this coming from? So I kind of bragged that we were able to analyze eight terabytes of data in 15 minutes. But then we sat on this for two months, trying to figure out what is going on, trying to figure out uh, how we should think about this. Um, first, I had to convince my colleagues that this is real. I believe this was real because I knew what we were doing with the data, what we were doing to the data, which was nothing. I knew that we were not doing anything to the data. This is just what's in the data. But uh, for uh, my experienced uh, X-ray specialist colleagues to believe in this to be real, we had to look at the raw data. So what I'm showing here is the cut along this line and along this line for these two different clusters. And you see indeed uh, the red diffuse region. So center here is the center of the peak but the diffuse region is showing this intensity um, all throughout phase two. And uh, the blue region, relatively speaking, is showing much weaker fluctuation, which, but then um, shows 
enhanced activities at lower temperature phase. So when we figured out, we can think about this clustering result by looking at the raw data, uh, that's when um, everybody was on board that this is real. And then we started trying to understand what's going on. And then it occurred to us, this is of course right. Um, I mean, data is right. But uh, this is, we, it occurred to us that this makes sense. Why does it make sense? Well, the order parameter, uh, one of the order parameter, candidate order parameters that we were considering was a two-dimensional order parameter. Two-dimensional order parameters have Mexican, Mexican hat. There is, there's, has to be a Goldstone mode if we indeed had a two-dimensional order parameter whose uh, symmetry with, with a, a weak um, symmetry breaking field. And um, by uh, tracking down the selection rule of when we see this fluctuation and when we do not, we were able to confirm that this fluctuation that we had observed, we are observing, we would, which was first observed through this uh, clustering result of this red cluster, is indeed consistent with uh, detection of goldstone mode fluctuations. And uh, this was the first instance of being able to detect goldstone mode fluctuations from um, X-ray data. Of course, to be able to infer that this is goldstone mode fluctuation required uh, further insight from the knowledge that we had outside of what's just in the data. But the, uh, the analysis is what took us to that insight. Now, uh, I'm going to switch gears and move on to another uh, type of data, which is now in the real space. Um, the correlation CNN for quantum images. And this work was uh, done in collaboration with a uh, group at Harvard and uh, the person who really uh, came up with uh, much of the insight as well as uh, doing the hard work was my student Cole Miles. So Fermi Hubbard model, uh, a famous model, uh, which has been long resisting being solved a solution. But um, this model was motivated by the phenomenology of uh, HPC superconductor. And now the simulations with um, Fermi gas, uh, ultra cold Fermi gases have now reached the stage where they can start to see uh, spin fluctuation and uh, uh, also reach sort of a strange metal regime. Um, quantum gas microscopy is uh, 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 the, the most um, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, useful way of looking at these systems. Is perhaps the uh, best way to look at the system at the moment. Uh, what what is being done is you have these uh, cold atoms, ultra cold atoms, in an optical lattice, and uh, what the measurement that is kind of unique about this system is that each measurement is uh, is, is a snapshot. It's not an uh, ensemble average, it's not thermodynamic, it's a snapshot. So you have this real space occupation snapshots in different channels, spin up, spin down, and hole. And the question is, once again, we have this data that uh, Ashcroft and Mermin or textbook would not tell us how we should interpret. Um, and uh, uh, under the Cupre being a difficult problem and mysterious state, uh, Different, very different theoretical perspectives may give you um, predict images that look not too difficult, that not too different. So this is uh, one ansatz for what the state could look like, geometric string. This is another ansatz called high flux theory. So uh, this is a quest that uh, uh, Harvard colleagues and others have been after for a, a while. And um, there was already off-the-shelf CNN convolutional neural network that was tried. But the problem with off-the-shelf um, convolutional neural network is that they are over-parameterized and um, it's a black box. So um, what Cole realized is that in a typical convolutional neural network, um, there is a convolutional convolutional stage where you take the filter and you convolve it with the image data to get a convolution map, and then you put it through nonlinearity. And practitioners all, all know that nonlinearity is extremely important because that's what gives you expressibility. 
However, uh, the uh, typical nonlinearity uh, is very hard to interpret because it is nonlinear. What Cole realized is that uh, if you use a filter that is positive definite, um, each order, nonlinear means beyond linear order. So first order, second order, each order of, of the convolution, so you take the convolution and may look at the higher powers, each order of convolution takes you to a correlation between multiple um, sites. So these, these are uh, animations showing that uh, the first order is looking at individual sites, but second order, because you involve two uh, sites from the filter, it's looking at two site correlation and third order looking at four, three site correlation. So Cole's idea was instead of using uh, out of the box nonlinear function that people just typically use without much thinking, let's make the nonlinearity controlled. So we take the convolution and we make a higher order nonlinearity, each of which are kind of measuring, assessing the importance of correlator at that order. And once we have a, a, convolutional, a, a correlation convolutional neural network, uh, CCNN, uh, we can interpret what it has learned uh, once we've trained it using what's called regularization path analysis. So this regularization path analysis is something that is uh, typical, is quite commonly used, but the dif difference is because of the architecture itself, having these um, different orders of correlation, when we use this regularization path analysis to see uh, which features when turned on make a difference in the learning outcome, we can figure out um, physical meaning of that feature. So when we um, train the neural network with the simulated data that was labeled between these two um, ansatz, the uh, geometric string and pi flux, we found that it was the fourth order, that is C4, the fourth order, uh, pow fourth power, that was giving the most meaningful difference in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the outcome accuracy compared to the label that we had given. So you see the jump in the accuracy, and uh, and the uh, and each of these were becoming important. So then we were able to look at what this fourth order correlation mean. Now, so fourth order correlation for a given filter. Once you have the filter, what you have to do is to figure out make just make you have to make four pixels. So for a particular filter that's given here, this would be one possibility of making four pixels. This is another way of making four pixels, pixels with weight, and you can go on like that. And then once we, we figured out, knowing that it was fourth order that was important, and having the filters that we've learned, when the two are combined, we were left with these motifs. And then we could real recognize those motifs in a, sort of a picture of a geometric string that is leaving whole moving through leaving a wake of uh, long bonds. And when that happens, there are these little pieces, these little motifs that uh, you can recognize in the uh, motifs that the uh, CCNN learned. And CCNN learned these um, to be important features by learning this particular uh, filter and making use of the fourth order correlation. So um, having learned this, we were able to say, what, was the, uh, what, what did the neural network learn when we trained it with the label data? And it was able to make, uh, uh, out, make the uh, assessments or uh, uh, um, classification that was uh, matching the label. We were also able to, we, we could also um, try this neural network on experimental data and figure out what more information we needed. Uh, the data that we first tried with did not have spin resolution. And we figured out uh, when we don't have spin resolution and, and as a result, not have a, a definite understanding of the whole density, uh, the neural network just learned to figure out what the density is and whenever the density is slightly off, that's what it was calling. So um, this uh, exercise 
uh, gave us insight into what one could measure if one wants to uh, distinguish, differentiate between these two possibilities, and what are really important things that needs to be measured for one to be able to make a meaningful distinctions. So um, to summarize, um, I've talked about um, approaches to try uh, to try to harness data revolution in quantum matter, and specifically, I talked about XTEC, which is um, temperature. X-ray temperature series clustering. Um, temperature can be replaced with some other control knob that's going to change the balance between different behaviors. Um, and also the same approach we believe can be applied to not just X-ray, but also to neutron and, uh, and um, give more insight. I've also talked about correlation of convolutional neural network where uh, using the higher order correlations as a way of um, implementing controlled systematic nonlinearity can give us insight into what kind of correlations matter. Now, um, before closing, I want to end on uh, this slide. When, um, uh, when, when I talk about using machine learning tools or data science tools, uh, there is always a question of, um, is it just automating? Is it just, uh, you know, a machines replacing people? And um, my view is that uh, like this group of West Area human computers led by uh, Dorothy Vaughan, who had a vision to learn to program, they were able to move on to the next job of becoming programmers from computers when the rest of the computers lost the jobs. The idea is there are these tools which can um, um, allow you to enable you to do new things. And um, it's, our, the, our, uh, it's our choice to make to decide whether we are going to learn to use them. So on that note, um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm not sure how we go about applauding. Maybe we unmute and applaud. <laughs> um, are there questions? Uh, Una, let me ask this question. Mm -hmm. how, how much data the scattering case you need uh, how big the data set you need sort of to find that thing with the... Um, so um, I emphasize big because if you have big data that's like beyond uh, manual search, that definitely justifies using a tool. But tool does not need data that's really super big. For instance, when we were developing the tool, we developed it on just like three, three four Brillouin zones. It was just some hundreds of kilobytes, I think. Um, so big is not a ne necessary condition. Now, um, for some things, having large volume with many brillant zones can give you confidence and statistics. So for instance, um, this looking at the diffuse region, we first started that we first gained um, some signal about that diffuse region be being different from the center of the peak looking at low resolution data, which had many, many, many Brillouin zones. And because it was low resolution, diffuse region was just one or two pixel. And when I first told Ray, look, Ray, these two pixels are becoming behaving differently from the center of the peak, he wouldn't believe me. He said, that's not possible. And I said, but this is not happening in just one Brillouin zone. This is happening in 100,000 Brillouin zone. So this must be real. And he still didn't believe me. So then we went to high resolution measurements so that we have many, many more uh, uh, pixels in the diffuse region and now fewer Brillouin zones. And, and then we started to really gain confidence. So when you're looking for, when you find something that's very unusual and want to have statistics, having large volume can be helpful, but it's not a necessary condition. Does that answer your question? Yes, great, thank okay. you. Are there other questions? May I ask another one then? 
Uh, sure. <laughs> can this tool, uh, we always struggle to see whether we can uh, do deconvolution either in mm. access or in frequency access. Mm -hmm. The data analysis is just sort of being a business in spectroscopy community mm -hmm. for a long time. Can one think about this could be a better approach than the typical deconvolution? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, so looking at, for instance, like uh, if you have time dependent data, right? Often what people do is Fourier transform. But, you know, uh, perhaps you can learn the signature or some voice print, like I, I call it voice print. Perhaps you can learn the voice print in the time series itself. So, you know, you can try to study the time series itself. I would love to do that. We're doing that with the uh, uh, monopole data from Seamus, but that's a different kind of um, problem. But I think it's really, um, it, for me personally, um, being able to use these tools really give me um, more room to explore uh, the data the way it is, the as it is. Uh, and new new angles to think about it. I used to be, uh, I I used to have my hands tied by what I know how how what I know how to do on my pencil and paper, right? Uh, but you know, with, with the help of computers, um, one can learn things that you didn't know how to imagine. Okay, thank you. So let me I. There are a number of things I'm confused about, but let me let me um, uh, see if I understood at least something. Um, mm -hmm. The um, so in the first the first uh, task you you set yourself, mm -hmm. there was a phase transition as a function of temperature, mm -hmm. and the question was what symmetry was broken at that phase transition. Right, right. And you, it was not a translation symmetry, it was somehow point group symmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't clear though from the data and by analyzing this, you were able to resolve that question. Right, so we knew it was um, point group symmetry breaking, um, but you know, because the, uh, the symmetry of the, uh, the high temperature phase was really large, it was a, a cubic system. Mm -hmm. And um, there were many different ways. There's a whole like branching. Uh, what could be the lower temperature phase? And because there is no, uh, no new uh, uh, superlattice peak showing up, it, it becomes sort of crystallographic question. But the distortions that gives rise to the symmetry breaking are very small. So it was hard to detect exactly what was going on. That was one thing. And, so in principle uh, yeah. though, just from the positions of the Bragg peaks, you should be able to tell what the symmetry is. It's just that it's very small distortions. Right, um, the positions of the Bragg peak, the, we know the lattice constants. So the lattice constants are not changing. Um, some of the Bragg peaks become, uh, they were not visible at higher temperature and they become visible. So they are like symmetry allowed, disallowed. Mm -hmm. That still leaves a whole host of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It does not narrow down uniquely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, right. All right. So and also another thing is the unit cell is really big. So um, even when you can figure out what uh, what is the lower temperature symmetry, you don't know what the atoms are doing. Our fluctuation analysis actually gave us a very detailed understanding of the distortions um, and, and how the atoms are moving fa in phase and out of phase. Um, not that that's what I was after. To be honest, I was after detecting pneumatic and we didn't find it. So that proves that I am a very honest scientist. <laughs> um, right, so, so it's, it's looking somehow at the pattern of the diffuse scattering, which is telling us about the fluctuations about- Right. The right. So um, pattern and the temperature dependence. So the diffuse scattering here, when I said this is diffuse scattering, uh, my colleagues again didn't believe me. They said, no, you don't have diffuse scattering over a whole phase. You can have diffuse scattering near a critical point, but you wouldn't have this level of, 
this wide diffuse scattering over a whole face. And indeed, it was an unusual thing. And the reason why we had a diffuse scattering over a whole phase, this phase two, was because it was a Goldstone mode. So I, that I don't completely understand either. I understand it's a two-dimensional representation, but mm -hmm. still, that just gives you some sort of uh, discrete symmetry. You're saying it's right. approximate Goldstone. Right. Mode? Yeah, but yeah. So, but this is this is actually uh, the, the, there is a continuous rotation that's possible between two um, two structures and um, and um, so the 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 what we don't under we the less understood part is the very low temperature phase, which we believe has to do with the rotation of this axis, the principal axis, the primary the direction. But um, the real really the order parameter has two axes, but the uh, it, there is a so there is an isotropy, but an isotropy is very weak. Maybe that's the way to put it. Because and um, there isn't. And, uh, there isn't a continuous symmetry to break, so there can't be a Goldstone mode, truly. Um, hmm. Now you're pushing the limits of my, uh, so my, 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 my understanding of these crystal symmetry groups is not, uh, not, um, it's, it's very new to me, but um, my understanding of this uh, particular thing is this is kind of like two dimensional in the sense of like PX plus IPY being two dimensional. And, you know, yes, there's PX and there's PY, but you can have linear superposition, PX plus IPY. There are two, uh, two symmetry possibilities and um, you can have linear superposition between the two. Apparently. Yeah, but in general, it picks one. It'll pick PX. It, yes, in general, you'll pick PX one. But I, yeah, but but for this system, there really was also system. right. But there is also a Raman um, uh, signature that was consistent with uh, this kind of uh, Goldstone mode uh, fluctuation. So that's how that's why we are interpreting this as, you know, because this is. There are several things, the range over temperature range over which we see the diffuse scattering and also the form factor where we see the diffuse scattering or where we don't see the diffuse, diffuse scattering and how this lines up with the Raman scattering uh, study that was specifically after uh, finding that fluctuation. That's, that's how we kind of deduce that this seems to be Goldstone mode fluctuation. Now, as far as I am concerned, what I can say with confidence is that we found very unusual um, diffuse scattering behavior that is sustained over a whole wide range of temperature in a phase and it goes away when you leave that phase. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I'm very, yeah. that's what I'm confident about. Yeah. 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 And my best explanation at the moment is that this seems to be most consistent with the Goldstone mode fluctuation. Um, we yeah. also see critical scattering but so we know what critical fluctuation looks like. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting fluctuation phenomena that I can say. Okay, and then, then I'm even more confused about the second half. So I didn't understand. Uh -huh. So I didn't understand what the question was. So what, the question was you here, have. Here I think there's a sharp question about what the symmetry right. is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So the question was, um, you have this data, you have these snapshots, and you want to figure out um, which, uh, which model or which idea gets closest to the data. But what does that mean? So this is a, I, uh, this is a hypothesis testing. So it's, it's a similar, it's the same kind of line as when, when we look at the STM data with, of disorder charge density wave. Um, I want to see whether my disorder charge density wave looks more like disorder from commensurate or disorder from incommensurate charge density wave. And um, the uh, idea is that I can look at it and see that this looks like one or the other. No, I, I, I have the impression of that. No, I, I think that there, at least there was a sharp question. The question right. was, if we could turn off disorder, what would we see? Mm -hmm. 
so you can argue about whether we would, um, how hard that question is right. to answer, but at least mm -hmm. I understand sharply what the question is. Here, I don't understand sharply what the question is. Um, so question here was more of, um, um, so let's, so maybe the better way to think about it is there are, uh, uh, there were simulation data that was used to train the neural network uh -huh. based on one model or another, you know, mean field model, some, some Monte Carlo simulations. Uh -huh. Okay. And the models were based on these two pictures. One was these are two uh, types of variational ansatz. Is yes. That what you're yeah. So so pi flux is variational ansatz. Geometric string was um, was uh, sort of uh, there was a model to do the Monte Carlo simulation. Both are variational ansatz essentially. Uh -huh. So you have these variational ansatz, and you get the pictures out of them, and the pictures look pretty similar to the experimental data. Both of them do. Uh -huh. um, and neither of them have sharp uh, features. They do not have, you know, they they both look similar to antiferromagnet because they are lightly doped. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's hard to tell. So maybe you can say maybe it's not very meaningful to try to distinguish them. Yeah. Now my my from our my group's interest was more. Um, you can train a neural network to distinguish these things. You can, turns out, so they were not that indistinguishable. You can ask whether they were meaningful tasks to test them with, but sometimes you cannot train a neural network to distinguish, you know, apple from apple. So it was at least not apple from apple. Turned out it was apple and orange, okay? But um, now uh, my, my collaborators then um, take such neural network and give the experimental data and ask, now you've been trained to tell apple and orange, does it look like apple to you or does it look like orange to you? And the neural network will say something. Yeah. Now, but they didn't know why it was saying one thing or another, whether that assessment was based on something meaningful or a fluke. And we applied this approach to this specific data and this specific hypothesis, but what um, Cole and I were really interested in is this mode of taking image-like data and asking the question of does this image resemble your favorite model A or favorite model B is a, a growing um, application of neural networks. And problem with all of those, including my own, is that people don't know why it was being called. And there is a very important and difficult question about generalizability of uh, neural networks. That um, you train on one thing and you take into something else, like you train on simulated data, you give it experimental data. Is it, call, uh, is it calling, is the refereeing job done by neural network done on based on meaningful, uh, meaningful observations? And poor generalizability means that it can be totally meaningless observations. So what we wanted to do was out, what we were really interested in was figuring out a framework when you use neural network to uh, call the shots on image like data that we know what is uh, being used to make that assessment. Yeah. And the insight was that by using this um, designed nonlinearity, we are actually looking for correlations and we can do that in a systematic way. And in this particular case, between these two simulated data sets, turns out foresight co correlation was much more important than anything else. And that was something that uh, none of us knew beforehand. We also learned that when you give that neural network to experimental data, it was only uh, pointing out the lack of knowledge in experimental data. So we knew when we should not take it to the experimental data. I don't know whether that was a, that was probably a very long answer, whether it was satisfactory or not. I, um, well, maybe we could, yeah, you, you, I, I'm interested to look to, uh, to hear more, but I think maybe we should let uh, people go now. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you very much. Uh, are there other questions? Okay. I had a general question about like, what? Uh, oh, sorry, no, I, I had a more general question about the classes of problems for which you think these big data approaches would be useful versus not. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, generally, if there is a satisfactory conventional approach, uh, you shouldn't do it. This is my principle of, you know, go for the, the right tool. Uh, so we would, uh, I would start thinking about a, a new approach when there isn't obviously a good approach. Um, and then after that, um, the next question that I ask for myself is, um, how uh, you know what kind of impact it's going to have like how how many people will be helped by developing this tool or what kind of uh, critical question will we be able to solve um for the case of quantum gas microscopy that's typic that's essentially the only way people study the uh the um quantum gas models with the experiments with so coming up with a better way to some way better way principled way to analyze those data, uh, to my mind, seem to be a very meaningful question, especially where the uh, that uh, experiments are at now after a mm -hmm. long time of development. And generally, I ask, I say, like, uh, am I dividing by zero? So um, I, I, I tell my students that, you know, if you divide anything by zero, generally, it's big. So uh, we're looking at the problems that we've I never think that I didn't know how to think about. Therefore, I just stayed away from um, things. Things to do with films, um, lead IV, which is some messy stuff, and it involves optimization. So, so when you have some large parameter space, and when many of these have the form of this inverse problems, right? Tomography is an example. X-ray is another example. These are inverse problems. So when you have to start from multi-parameter model and try to invert your way back, there are um, optimization schemes that have been developed for self-driving cars that has to work efficiently and accurately. And those kind of schemes can help you from help you move forward from uh, the approaches that's been stuck for 30 years, you know, th that that's, that's another example. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, if what my experience has been, if I find a problem that uh, that didn't seem to have a good solution, um, oftentimes, I can, we've been able to find ways to make meaningful progress. So I don't know, did that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there other questions? Okay, so why don't we thank, uh, thank Una again for a very stimulating talk. Thank you. Thank you.